Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our, our webinar today uh, on the, the latest uh, MyWoma research updates from the ASH 2020 meeting. My name is Gabriele Closerto. I'm the Manager of Education and Patient Services at MyWoma Canada. Um, before we get to our webinar today, I'm just going to go over a few things as I, as I usually do. Um, so uh, do you see yeah, the slides have changed? Good. So uh, I'd like to firstly thank our sponsors uh, for providing us uh, with uh, educational grants to make uh, to, to make these webinars uh, possible. So uh, thank you to Amgen, Binding Site, uh, BMS, Janssen, Takeda, and Sanofi Genzyme. Um, as you, as many of you know, these webinars are recorded uh, and they're uh, they're uploaded onto our YouTube channel. So to access those recordings at later date, you're going to receive a lot of information today. So uh, you may want to go over some of the slides or or, or uh, maybe hear hear some of the information one more time uh, so that it's clear. Uh, so to do that, you go to YouTube.com. Um, and in the search bar, you, you type Myeloma Canada, and then you click on the search button. And the, one of the first links you'll see is the Myeloma Canada uh, uh, channel. To subscribe to the channel, you click on the subscribe button. Um, and then once you subscribe to it, you can also click on this little bell icon, which will give you a notification every time we put up a new video. So that's a good way to stay up to date with any of the uh, of the newest, uh, newest webinars that, that we're presenting. Um, it, from your tablet or from your phone, it's the same concept. You have the YouTube app or from your browser, you go to YouTube and uh, just search My Loma Canada and you should be able to find us. If you, if you still have trouble finding us from our website, uh, myloma.ca, click on the resources button, uh, a sub menu will open up. You just click on educational videos and that'll uh, I'll send you over to our, uh, to our YouTube channel. Lastly, before we start, how do you ask questions? So the, the format that we usually use for these webinars is you type in your questions, I receive the questions, and then we have a Q&A &A discussion at the end of the, uh, of the session. Uh, so to do that from your, uh, this is the view from a PC. Uh, this is what the software looks like. So uh, you have a little questions tab and you type in your question, you click send on a tablet or on a, on a phone. It's pretty much the same thing. You click on the questions button, you type in your question and you press send and I should, I should receive that. Um, so, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Tony Ryman, who's professor uh, at Dalhousie University. Uh, he's also the lead of the Myeloma Priority Setting Partnership um, and, uh, and uh, part of the Canadian Cancer Society Research Chair at the University of New Brunswick in St. John's. Dr. Ryman, thanks, uh, thanks for taking the time today to, uh, to do this presentation for us. It's, it's much appreciated. Uh, we don't hear you. How's that? Yeah, we hear you now. Awesome. Okay, great. I have too many mute buttons. Well, th thanks, Gabrielle, for uh, inviting me uh, to speak to everyone today. It's a pleasure to be here. I uh, can't really tell myself who's who's on the line, but I gather we've got a decent number of people signed up, mostly patients and uh, family members. And so, so welcome to all. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tony Ryman, as Gabrielle was saying. And so I'm going to try and give you an update on myeloma from the American Society of Hematology annual meeting that was held in December, uh, virtually this year. So a different meeting than, than usual, perhaps. But uh, the last couple of years, uh, this is how how we've been getting our information to one another in the myeloma research community. And it really worked pretty well. Um, it's nice uh, because the quality of the uh, uh, presentations, uh, recordings uh, at the meeting are, are very good and for a fee you can go in and watch any of the oral presentations of research at the meeting. So I've had the opportunity to virtually attend the meeting and uh, view many uh, presentations. I've, for this presentation I'm going to focus on clinical trials of treatment for myeloma. There was other research presented on myeloma, you know, I can't hope to cover it all in one session, uh, and I haven't even really had a chance to uh, review all the research that was presented on myeloma at the meeting in depth. It's such a such a huge meeting, but I think this is a lot of the key stuff that was presented, and I'm going to try and put it in to the context of how we treat myeloma in Canada and uh, where things might be going, and how these latest updates sort of add to our sense of where things are going with myeloma treatment. So um, I'm going to try and advance my slides here. There we go. So um, okay, it seems to be working. So just just to refresh 
your memories. And I'm sure there's a variety of people viewing this presentation with different backgrounds and levels of, uh, uh, you know, prior knowledge on on this topic of myeloma treatment. But this is just a short list of the types of myeloma treatments that we have available in Canada. And so there's different types of uh, drug treatments, mostly that I'm talking about here. I mean, I haven't talked about things like radiation, um, other things, but, but mostly drug treatment here. So uh, there's different classes of myeloma drugs. So there are different drugs that all sort of belong in one class or category. One such category is proteasome inhibitors, things like bortezomib or Velcade, carfilzomib or caprolis, ixazomib or nidlaro, those, those types of drugs that some of you will be very familiar with. There's the immunomodulatory drugs or IMIDs like lenalidomide and pomalidomide, those drugs that are sort of derivatives of thalidomide, which we don't really use that much anymore in Canada. Um, there's steroids like prednisone and dexamethasone uh, that are often found in most myeloma treatment regimens. Alkylating agents, so older chemotherapy type drugs like cycl cyclophosphamide and melphalan. Uh, and then some of the newer drugs like monoclonal antibodies, these are sort of designer drugs that can attack proteins that are found selectively on myeloma cells. For example, the CD or CD38 protein on myeloma cells that can be targeted with daratumumab and isotuximab, or the SLAMF7 protein that can be targeted with elotuzumab. We do have... Uh, sort of the original forms of cell therapy for myeloma available in Canada, and that's stem cell transplant, um, autologous transplant most commonly done, but sometimes allogeneic transplant. We won't get into the details of what that is today, but um, um, that's probably a topic for another day, but certainly that's the backbone of myeloma therapy for uh, those patients who are eligible for it. And then we also have therapies directed at trying to help shore up bones against the damage caused by myeloma, things like dysphosphonates or thrangligand antibody, denosumab. So that's just a refresher on the treatments we have that you can use to put the following information into perspective. So um, this is just a cartoon kind of summarizing how we might treat patients who are going to have a stem cell transplant or who are not going to. So Probably just under half of myeloma patients end up undergoing a autologous stem cell transplant, most commonly. This is really just a convoluted way of getting a high dose of melphalan chemotherapy into a patient. And the uh, stem cell transplant really just means we're harvesting blood stem cells from the patient before we give the high dose chemotherapy, and then we give those stem cells back to the patient afterwards because the high dose chemotherapy will kind of wipe out the body's uh, blood stem cells and so those are needed to reconstitute the patient's uh, blood production after the high-dose chemotherapy. So not all our patients receive that but uh, some do and when they do typically they start with more standard dose chemotherapy that's the induction phase then we'll mobilize and put those stem cells in the freezer so we can give them back to the patient after the high-dose chemo Then the patient receives their high dose of melphalan 200 milligrams per meter squared get their stem cells back, and uh, after the patient recovers from the effects of the high-dose chemotherapy, sometimes they receive something called consolidation, which is treatment often similar in nature to the induction treatment in case there's a need to further improve the depth of treatment response after the transplant. And then patients typically go into a maintenance phase where they take long-term therapy to maintain the remission they have achieved with the prior treatment. Um, on the other hand, patients who do not receive autologous stem cell transplant, typically these are people who uh, might be uh, more frail, have a lot of other health issues, sometimes just by virtue of being uh, older in age. Uh, those things kind of go hand in hand with uh, greater challenges with trying to get through high dose chemotherapy. So patients who don't receive a transplant or who choose not to, can be treated with more standard doses of drug therapy as opposed to the high dose chemotherapy given up here. And this treatment is generally given continuously because it seems that for the most part, continuous treatment maintains longer remissions. So in Canada, uh, 
just to populate these cartoons with some of the treatment regimens we use. For the transplant eligible patient, we often give a combination of cyclophosphamide, bortezomib, and dexamethasone in the induction phase. Hydrosmelphalan, stem cell transplant. We don't usually do a consolidation phase for most patients in Canada. The evidence that it improves the outcome is a bit uh, conflicting, and um, we typically go straight to the maintenance phase. We might give some patients consolidation, depending on whether they have high risk disease or have had a less than robust response to high dose chemotherapy. And then with maintenance, most patients receive oral lenalidomide or revlimid therapy, and some will receive bortezomib, typically patients with high risk uh, cytogenetic abnormalities in their myeloma cells. On the other hand, patients not receiving a transplant typically get either lenalidomide and dexamethasone frontline treatment or the same kind of cyclophosphamide, bortezomib, dexamethasone, or, or a similar regimen like that. Those are the most widely available frontline therapies in Canada. Some patients will receive other therapies, sometimes in the context of clinical trials. So at the ASH 2020 meeting, uh, frontline treatment for both transplant eligible and ineligible patients was examined in clinical trials. So I'm gonna start with the transplant eligible patients. So there was an update on this trial, which is uh, the IFM 2009 trial. So long-term follow-up of patients who were randomly assigned to receive or not receive a transplant as part of their initial therapy in the context of a bortezomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone uh, regimen or RVD regimen. So patients were randomized to receive RVD alone or RVD plus a transplant. Now, practically speaking, this is a trial of immediate versus delayed transplant because the intent was to collect stem cells early on and then have the option of doing a transplant in the future, even for patients who didn't receive it up front. So asking a question in the modern era, in the era of cortisone inhibitors and imid drugs, do we still need to give everyone a frontline transplant? And this is the update on progression-free survival, this graph showing the percentage of patients still alive and free of progression of their myeloma over time. The orange curve on top is the patients who uh, received a transplant as part of their initial therapy with better progression-free survival results than those who did not. So that's certainly an argument in favor of having a transplant as part of your initial therapy. On the right-hand side, though, you can see that overall survival between the two groups those who received upfront transplant and those who did not uh, was not really significantly different. So there's an argument that you could delay your transplant and not have it as part of your frontline treatment. But you know, 88% of the patients who did not have a transplant upfront ended up having a transplant later on. That was the design of the study. And so, you know, the general feeling, I think, amongst a lot of us, at least in Canada, is that. These data mostly argue in favor of continuing to incorporate transplant as part of the initial treatment, you know, to make sure people have the opportunity to, to have a transplant because we know that having a transplant at some point is important in maximizing longevity if you're eligible to receive one. Uh, and, you know, your initial remission is going to be longer. Uh, not everyone who uh, delays their transplant actually ends up getting one, as you can see. So there was about 12% who didn't receive a transplant. So. Uh, this is the thinking uh, in 2021. We should continue to incorporate high dose melphalan and auto transplant when we can up front. Um, what's the role of uh, minimal residual disease assessment in determining who should have a transplant up front? That's a question that we ask. So, this idea of minimal residual disease assessment is that sensitive newer techniques can measure small amounts of residual myeloma after treatment that aren't detected with conventional methods. Uh, Perhaps the most sensitive method to date is using next generation sequencing to identify myeloma cells in the bone marrow. And this graph just shows that it still matters whether or not um, you have a transplant up front. Um, if you have a transplant up front, you know, it doesn't matter whether you achieve MRD negative status or, or not. Um, it seems like you do better in terms of uh, progression free survival if you have a transplant up front. Although it also seems that you do better if you achieve uh, negative minimal residual disease status. So no residual disease is detectable even with these sensitive genetic sequencing methods. 
uh, your prognosis is, is even better. But uh, we don't yet know that we could omit high-dose chemotherapy for patients who achieve an MRD negative uh, response. So we don't recommend that at this time. This is another trial, a more recent trial, a smaller trial. So it's a phase two trial. Phase three trials are kind of large practice changing trials. Phase two trials are smaller and uh, not always regarded as a sufficient level of evidence to change practice. But this is another randomized trial comparing different approaches to treatment of the transplant eligible patient. In this case, incorporating carfilzomib or caprolis as part of the initial therapy. So, um, the first part of the study looked at whether or not patients should get one of these three regimens. Um, in the orange, patients got caprolis with cyclophosphamide and dexamethasone and had an autologous transplant. In the blue arm, patients got revlimid instead of cyclophosphamide as part of the regimen and also got a transplant. And in green, there were patients who received the KRD regimen uh, for 12 cycles, but did not have a transplant up front. And what this graph shows is that the patients uh, who received KRD with a transplant had the best progression-free survival curve on the, on the graph here. And uh, but actually, patients who got the KRD regimen without a transplant seem to be doing even better than those who got the KCD regimen with a transplant uh, in terms of progression-free survival. It remains to be seen exactly what the long-term outcomes are in these uh, three arms. But this, this is uh, an interesting result and then sort of an interesting update. We had heard something about it at previous meetings. But, um, Second randomization in this trial was looking at the maintenance phase of treatment after the transplant. So should you receive lenalidomide alone or should we add carfilzomib to lenalidomide maintenance therapy? And what the results presented uh, here were showing is that progression-free survival is improved by adding carfilzomib to the maintenance phase. Uh, so this is an interesting result. Um, certainly, uh, adding carfilzomib to such a treatment can increase the uh, frequency that patients have to visit uh, the daycare unit to get their carfilzomib infusions, especially in the maintenance phase, and can potentially add some side effects to the treatment, although major toxicity was not a major issue in this trial. Um, but, um, you know, an interesting result nonetheless and suggests that the more we can continue to intensify the treatment by adding our best drugs up front and continuing to give those, you know, maybe the better patients will do in terms of disease control. And I guess the argument then is, well, how do you find that balance between, you know, what's too much treatment? Um, but this is an interesting result. And uh, with this and other studies looking to add additional drugs, especially to the maintenance phase of treatment, you know, we may eventually start recommending this to people down the road that combination maintenance therapy may, may, may be worthwhile. Uh, I'm not sure if that trial is going to lead to immediate uh, you know, application of this treatment in Canada, partly because we don't yet know what the long-term overall survival results are, and also because it's a relatively small study. This is another small study looking at incorporating daratumumab, that CD38 antibody we mentioned earlier, into the upfront treatment of patients undergoing autologous transplant. And this is just a short summary demonstrating that if you add daratumumab to the treatment, the depth of response tends to be better. So we have some short-term results on this trial showing responses are, are better if you add daratumumab, and it'll be interesting over the longer term to see how that translates into long-term outcome. Uh, but there's a lot of interest in adding CD38 antibodies to the frontline treatment of transplant eligible patients. Um, and uh, it's going to take a while to see what the long term impact of this is in these trials. For patients who are not planned to undergo upfront transplant, we have uh, updated results on trials of frontline therapy from ASH 2020. This is an updated uh, progression free survival graph for patients in the Maya trial, which assigned patients to receive either. Revlimid and dexamethasone alone, or the same treatment with daratumumab or darzalex added. 
and we now have a 48-month progression-free survival comparison showing 60% of patients in the daratumumab containing arm still free of progression of their disease compared to 38% in the treatment arm of revlimid and dexamethasone without daratumumab. So this is this is an impressive result in the purple arm here, and uh, sort of better than we've seen with you know earlier uh, myeloma treatments, including those that are most readily available in Canada. So this is certainly promising, and certainly hoping that this treatment will become available to Canadian myeloma patients in the not too distant future. It has not yet been uh, all the way through our uh, Canadian. Uh, regulatory system for evaluating drug approvals and particularly funding uh, approval in the Canadian provinces. So uh, this is working its way through our system now. So uh, other drugs are being combined with Revlimid and dexamethasone in clinical trials. Uh, you know, we've seen previous trials with carfilzomib, bortezomib, combining proteasome inhibitors with Revlimid and dexamethasone. This is a trial with exazomib, the oral proteasome inhibitor marketed in Canada by Takeda and in Laro. And they presented results of their frontline trial of Revdex with or without exazomib. And certainly uh, an impressive uh, difference in the median progression-free survival was seen in, in this uh, presentation. 35 months progression-free survival with Exazomib, Treflamid Dex versus 21.8 months with Revdex alone. Uh, a meaningful difference in the outcome. Um, and, you know, this study was perhaps uh, a little smaller, and uh, I mean, there were 700 patients in the trial, but thus far, this, this difference in outcome is not uh, beyond that sort of 0 0.05 statistical significance level that we typically want to see uh, in this number here. Uh, so the long and short of this is, it seems like this regimen also improves outcome, but um, whether this result will be sufficient to see this regimen widely approved in Canada or other countries and used, I guess, remains to be seen. Um, so an interesting all oral therapy uh, regimen. So, you know, going back to our original cartoon about initial therapy for myeloma, maybe in the next few years we'll see better options come along as uh, the results of these trials mature and get evaluated by Canadian authorities. And, uh, so we might start using a uh, proteasome inhibitor in combination with an imid and a steroid up front, and we may start adding daratumumab to that at some point. That may be a little further off. Um, for those patients who need consolidation, we might see the same regimens used, and we might start to see daratumumab or proteasome inhibitor added to lenalidomide maintenance therapy. Um, for patients ineligible for transplant, there's now a significant number of proteasome inhibitor imid steroid combinations uh, that seem to be better than, you know, the ones we use now, especially if you add daratumumab and uh, so we hope to see those regimens coming to our patients before too long. I'm going to shift gears now and talk a bit about relapsed myeloma. So just as an overview, you know, how we treat someone whose myeloma has relapsed after they've had some initial therapy or whose disease is refractory to their initial therapy depends a bit on what was used initially and how well it worked. You know, in general, what we're going to do is reach for combinations of effective treatments and try and apply those continuously for as long as they seem to be beneficial to a patient. And we're going to reach for drugs that have not yet failed to work. So by that, I mean either drugs that we haven't yet used or types of drugs we haven't used to treat the myeloma, or we'll reach for drugs that worked really well previously, but maybe for some other reason, you know, the drugs were not continued indefinitely. And we can go back to those because they might still be effective. Um, when a given line of treatment for myeloma becomes ineffective, we're going to change the treatment. So patients may go through several lines of therapy over the course of time. So that's just a real general conceptual overview of what we do. And we're going to reach for those different types of drugs that I listed at the beginning of the talk. 
and combine them based on evidence from clinical trials. So here's an example of a trial uh, of a combination therapy for relapsed myeloma that was presented at ASH. Uh, that may have an impact uh, for Canadian patients at some point. This was a randomized study looking at adding daratumumab to pomalidomide and dexamethasone. So like lenalidomide and dexamethasone, this is an effective combination imid steroid regimen. And so patients who have relapsed disease, the question asked of this trial is, can we add daratumumab and get a better outcome? One nice thing about this study is the subcutaneous route of daratumumab administration was used. Uh, this approach, you know, is much more convenient for patients and saves a lot of time in the chemotherapy administration units uh, because it's a much quicker route of administration than intravenous daratumumab. So the long and short of it is patients have uh, longer remissions if they receive daratumumab with POMDEX as compared to POMDEX alone. As you can see on this graph, the purple curve is the proportion of people free of progression of their myeloma with the daratumumab containing regimen versus the orange non-daratumumab containing regimen. 52% progression free at one year versus 35%. So uh, that's an important degree of improvement. And uh, so another demonstration that you can combine a CD38 antibody with POMDEX and improve outcomes. And you know we're seeing this is being evaluated also with isotuximab with you know, uh, similar success. And uh, so we're looking forward to seeing CD38 antibody POMDEX combinations available to our patients in Canada at some point. Um, typically, this for, will be for people who have not already had daratumumab uh, or isotuximab in earlier lines of therapy. But there's still going to be a group of myeloma patients in Canada like this for some time haven't yet had daratumumab, and this, this could provide another treatment option for them. Uh, and, you know, it seemed to go pretty well. The toxicity was quite manageable and in keeping with what we would expect in previous trials of daratumumab combined with other agents. Um, CD38 antibodies are also being combined with proteasome inhibitors for relapsed myeloma. This is the updated results of the CANDER trial looking at adding daratumumab to carfilzomib and dexamethasone. We already have daratumumab, bortezomib, and dexamethasone available to Canadian patients for relapsed myeloma. Um, this study demonstrates that adding daratumumab also improves the outcome uh, to when added to the carfilzomib dex regimen. And updated results on a similar approach with isotuximab, another CD38 antibody added to carfilzomib and dexamethasone so adding the antibody again improves the effectiveness of the treatment. So we can we can offer carfilzomib and dexamethasone to our patients with relapsed myeloma, and for those who might today be you know, considered uh, as good candidates to receive this treatment, hopefully in the not too distant future we'll be able to, as a matter of routine, add a CD38 antibody for those who have not yet received one. Some of you will have heard of this drug, Selenexor, which is a different type of drug. It's been evaluated for relapsed myeloma. Some of you may have received this drug in clinical trials, as many Canadian centers have been able to offer this treatment to their patients through clinical trials or expanded access programs. Uh, this was updated results looking at combining Selenexor with bortezomib and dexamethasone for relapsed myeloma. And once again, Progression-free survival is better for patients who get cell and XOR. This drug causes some GI toxicity, which needs to be managed. Uh, but certainly, it's great to see this new type of myeloma drug being developed. And uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see what place we find for this. Certainly, there's a crowded landscape of myeloma treatments, and uh, you know, so when we're going to reach for cell and XOR, I think relative to some of the other treatments that are available is, is uh, you know, part of the changing landscape of myeloma treatment. And I think remains to be determined, but uh, we'll see how that plays out. I'm gonna uh, just talk about a couple of presentations by Canadian myeloma clinician researchers. 
of trials that some of you may have participated in. Some of the results of those trials were presented at the meeting, so you may be interested to hear about those. This was a trial with the Canadian Myeloma Research Group led by Dr. Seabag, where patients with relapsed myeloma received daratumumab, cyclophosphamide, and dexamethasone. And they were randomly assigned to either receive pomalidomide as part of the initial treatment, along with the other three drugs, or to just receive the, the three drugs, and then if the myeloma was not well controlled, to add the pomalidomide later. And uh, so the long and short of it is that uh, if you add pomalidomide up front, you get a better response rate, 88% versus 50%. But many of those patients that you subsequently add pomalidomide later, you know, do subsequently respond to the treatment. So many of the people who didn't respond over here then were able to respond later over here. Um, if you look at the survival curves here, progression-free survival on the left, not a huge difference in the, those curves, but maybe some, some uh, improvement in outcome by receiving pomalidomide up front as compared to deferring it until later. And interestingly, overall survival in this trial was better by combining all four drugs up front. And this was not a given, you know, I mean, four drugs is a lot for someone with relapsed myeloma to have to take and deal with the side effects and risks. And uh, so this is an important result that continues to reinforce the idea we should try and give all our best drugs as soon as we can, you know, within reason, uh, to get the best control of the myeloma. So, um, you know, there's a group of patients who may may be able to benefit by not receiving all four drugs at once. I mean, there's a group who did very well without receiving all four drugs at once. So some work is ongoing to see if we can identify who really needs four drugs and maybe who, who can be treated with three. Um, that's a challenge before us. Uh, Christine Chen and Daryl White uh, submitted this abstract and I think Dr. White presented this paper on cell and exor in combination with POMDEX for patients with more heavily pretreated myeloma. And uh, in summary, we're seeing nice uh, rates of response to combination therapy, even in patients who may have been uh, refractory to pomalidomide in the past, you can see responses to this cell and exor POMDEX combination. So the addition of cell and exor helping to overcome that treatment resistance that those patients were having to POMDEX. So uh, another promising uh, regimen. Uh, Dr. Trudell presented the results of the CMRG study looking at combining uh, pomalidomide and dexamethasone with another newer type of drug, Belantamab mafodotin. So this is an antibody drug conjugate. So a drug that binds to another protein on the surface of myeloma cells called BCMA and delivers a chemotherapy drug to those myeloma cells that's attached to the antibody. So this combination seemed to work quite well, um, seeing, you know, depending on the group of patients you look at, very high response rates, anywhere from 88 to 100 percent. For all comers, it was about 88 percent. For those refractory to IMIDs and proteasome inhibitors, 92%. For those refractory to IMIDs, proteasome inhibitors, and daratumumab, 100%. So it didn't seem to matter which drugs you'd had previously. Response rates were very high. Although, you know, if you look at the progression-free survival curves over here, whoops, um, maybe those who are refractory to more drugs have a shorter duration of response. Uh, but, you know, this, this combination of pomalidomide, dexamethasone, and, and uh, belantamab, mafodotin compares favorably to all the other pomalidomide combinations we've seen, and uh, I'm sure we'll undergo further study, and certainly belantamab is uh, being studied in earlier lines of therapy as well. Here's a, just a brief reference to uh, looking at sort of the next generation uh, uh, what are called cell mods, which are cousins of the IMIDs or immunomodulatory drugs, ibrutamide being one of the lead compounds. Uh, this study looking at combining ibrutamide with daratumumab and dexamethasone or bortezomib and dexamethasone 
in patients previously fairly heavily pretreated, significant response rates, 42% to this regimen, 60% to this regimen. Uh, so encouraging. And uh, so these drugs are also being studied in clinical trials in Canada. And uh, so hoping that uh, these next generation drugs will further improve outcomes. Um, so those are all drugs that, um, you know, Canadian patients in some cases have had the opportunity to try either in clinical trials or in routine practice, or perhaps expanded access programs where the drugs are made available on a compassionate basis. Uh, I'm going to just touch now as we sort of get into the last bit of my presentation on some of the newer immune therapy types of treatment uh, presented at the ASH meeting. So that belantamab mafodotin treatment is an example of a one of these newer newer therapies, but uh, it's one of the first ones, and it's been around a little longer than some of the others, particularly in Canada. Some of you in Canada have had the opportunity to be treated with some of these types of new therapies in clinical trials as well. So um, we have different types of immune therapies. We've got antibody drug conjugates, like belantamab and mafodotin. We have CAR T or other types of cell therapies. We'll talk about briefly. Then we have a new type of antibody drug uh, called bispecific antibodies. And all of these aim to get our immune system to go and attack myeloma cells by recognizing proteins that are found fairly uniquely on the surface of myeloma cells and found less so on other normal healthy cells in the body. The targets of these immunotherapies, uh, most of them target BCMA, which is the target of plantamab mafodotin. But there are two new targets uh, for which the first clinical trials were showing some promising results were presented at ASH this year, uh, GPCR5D and FCRH5. I'll touch on all this briefly. So what is CAR T-cell therapy? We'll start with that. So T-cells are part of our immune system and they help us fight off invaders. Uh, most typically we think of our immune system fighting off infection, but our immune system has an important role to play in, in fighting cancer. And perhaps is the reason we don't all have cancer, is that our immune system may be controlling a certain amount of cancer in our body for us. But when a patient gets myeloma, clearly this has escaped our immune system's surveillance. T cells are an important part of this. And, and in CAR T cell therapy, what we do is we, we remove T cells from a patient's own body, typically, genetically modify those T cells so that they're going to attack that protein we're looking at on the myeloma cells, perhaps BCMA, one of those other targets I mentioned, grow up millions or even billions of those cells in the lab, and then infuse those genetically modified T cells back into the patient so they can circulate through the body, find the cancer cells, in this case, the myeloma cells, uh, recognize those by the BCMA on the cells, and then kill those cancer cells. So there are uh, many uh, clinical trials out there evaluating CAR T cells targeting BCMA. These are the oral presentations uh, at ASH 2020 on the topic. Uh, you know, there's like eight presentations on seven different CAR T cells uh, targeting BCMA, all showing significant anti-myeloma activity. So uh, some of these you've heard about before, and perhaps the one that's furthest along getting towards, uh, you know, routine use is this one called IDACEL or BB2121. Uh, not yet routinely available in Canada. Um, we'll see if, if that emerges as, as being a standard option in Canada at some point. Uh, these therapies you know, we're still waiting to see how we can harness CAR T cells to get more durable long-term remissions. And uh, this is the challenge. We see a high response rate, but we see patients continuing to relapse. There's excitement about CAR T cells because there are some cancers for which they have proven to be curative, particularly B cell lymphomas, certain types of B cell leukemia, including childhood leukemias. But we have not yet seen a significant, you know, evidence of, uh, cures in myeloma with this, this approach. So there's some work to be done there. Uh, but certainly 
for heavily pretreated patients uh, whose disease is refractory to many of the available therapies we have, to see these kinds of responses is encouraging, and that further work is ongoing to try and harness the power of CAR T cells. Um, one interesting presentation about BCMA CAR T cells was, was this one, where instead of using a patient's own T cells to create the CAR T cell product to treat myeloma, uh, someone else's T cells have been been used, and the advantage here is that if you can uh, you know, modify these donor T cells uh, so that they don't cause any harm to the patient beyond what you would expect with uh, their own T cells, that this is more of an off-the-shelf product. You don't have to collect T cells from the patient and then go off and genetically modify them and grow them in the lab and then get them back to the patient. So that all is a process that takes time and resources. And in this case, um, instead you've got cells ready to go, the patient needs them, you order them and you give them to the patient and uh, you don't have to make them uh, individually for each patient. So this was an interesting trial in that these folks proved the principle that you could treat myeloma this way. Um, although, you know, Again, I think there's a lot of work to be done to get these cells working really well to try to cure myeloma or at least get a long-term remission. And uh, we don't yet know if these even work as well as the ones that are made by a person with it, using a person's own T cells. Uh, but, but there's certainly hope that we could get there. So that's CAR T cells. Just shifting gears uh, to different immunotherapies, uh, the bispecific molecules bispecific antibodies or bites or other types of bispecific proteins, what they do is um, they're kind of like those CD38 antibodies like daratumumab or cetuximab in that they are designed to target a myeloma surface protein. So they have an area on these molecules that will bind to the myeloma cell, say by binding to BCMA or another target on a myeloma cell. But then this molecule will bind to the patient's own T cells and in so doing, it's going to bring a patient's own T cells together with the myeloma. And regardless of whether that T cell is sort of intrinsically inclined to recognize and attack a myeloma cell, this drug is going to sort of bring those cells together and say, hey, look, you know, this T cell should attack this myeloma cell anyway, um, because we've used this green part here to bring the T cell over to a myeloma cell. And we've used this red part to bring the T cell over, and we're going to, you know, that's going to cause the T cell to fire its guns against the myeloma cell. So that's how these molecules work in, in a nutshell. And several presentations about bispecific molecules targeting BCMA on myeloma cells were presented, uh, including teclistimab, this AMG701, this Regeneron 5458, this TNB383B as well as you know those antibody drug conjugates that I mentioned earlier, that instead of bringing T cells to the myeloma cell, they bring a chemotherapy drug to the myeloma cell, like Belomath or another one uh, called Medi-2228. So all of these drugs are targeting BCMA with antibodies in one way or another and have shown anti-myeloma activity, which is exciting. Um, this is a presentation of a new uh, you know, by, by specific antibody targeting a new uh, immunotherapy target on myeloma cells called FCRH5. So instead of targeting BCMA, we target FCRH5. Uh, this study was also done in, in Canada, in Toronto, among other centers. Patients receiving this treatment have some of the common side effects we can see with um, CAR T cell therapies or by specific antibody therapies. Uh, this is one called cytokine release syndrome, where these drugs induce a brisk immune response that can actually make a patient unwell. Uh, and there can be some neurological components to this. Um, thankfully, um, with these bispecific antibodies, those side effects tend to be relatively low grade in most patients and manageable and tend to be most predominant with the initial uh, initiation of therapy. And then it you know, kind of fades out after that. But these drugs are working. We're seeing response rates to this new FCR H5 target, which is exciting. And we're seeing the same thing with this new, new drug, Alquetamab, which targets a new 
immune target on myeloma cells, GPRC5D. So this is another bispecific antibody that brings those T cells to the myeloma cells uh, through this, this cell surface protein. And uh, again, seeing some of those same side effects that we would see with BCMA targeted therapies or CAR T cell therapies, but again, they tend to be manageable much more so than with early generation CAR T cell therapies. Uh, although newer generation CAR T cells, we're also seeing improvements that are reducing the toxicity. Uh, and again, we're seeing significant response rates in these heavily pretreated patients, uh, you know, at this dose level over 70%. Uh, and at this dose level, which is the recommended phase two dose, again, almost 70% response rates. So, you know, that's remarkable. Uh, for a new new drug for heavily pretreated patients. Yeah, promising. So this is a slide from Dr. Mateos from Spain, and I thank her for providing some of the slides uh, for this talk as she, she gave an educational update post-ASH recently for our Canadian physician colleagues. And I'd like to, by the way, thank all my colleagues who presented many of these research studies at ASH who sent me their, their presentations so I could, could look at them and present them to you today. But uh, here's a potential outline of a future landscape of myeloma treatment in the not too distant future, really depending on the availability of these treatments in part, but you know, where upfront we'll combine proteasome inhibitors with IMIDs and CD38 antibodies. And then for transplant eligible patients, we're probably still gonna be giving high dose melphalan and autologous transplant or allogeneic transplant for selected patients for a while. And then maintenance therapy is probably eventually gonna be augmented, so we'll add CD38 antibodies or proteasome inhibitors or other drugs to lenalidomide. And then for patients who relapse, we're gonna be figuring out where to use these bispecifics or antibody drug conjugates or CAR T cells. And then looking at you know, these POMDEX or carfilzomib based combinations. And uh, who knows what else uh, might come along, but that's, that's what the near future may hold. So in summary, um, you know, we'll have some time for questions and answers at the end, but uh, combination and sequencing of existing therapies is leading to improved control of myeloma in clinical trials. And we hope that more of these newer combinations and sequences of therapy will be made available in Canada in the next few years. Immunotherapy is perhaps the most rapidly, type, rapidly developing type of new myeloma treatment or indeed new cancer treatment. And we've seen some promising results at ASH 2020. Uh, these immunotherapies need further development, but uh, they promise to continue to improve our ability to treat myeloma. These new treatments are a challenge to deliver in our publicly funded healthcare system, or really in any healthcare system, because they're expensive to develop, they're expensive to provide to patients, and, and they can be more resource intensive than our older treatments. Uh, so that has to be worked out, uh, but certainly. We'll be working on it. So I think I'll stop there and uh, Gabrielle can moderate uh, some Q&A. Awesome, thank you, doc Dr. Ryman, for, uh, for the uh, overview of what was presented uh, in December. Um, so uh, we have a few questions that, that came in here. And the, the, the first one I'm gonna ask you, it's, it's not anything you presented, um, but there's someone asking if there's any research uh, or anything that's been presented lately uh, uh, with regards to people who have uh, uh, translocation 414. Uh, I guess maybe, you know, how are they handled in, in routine Canadian practice? Do they get different treatment? And are there, is there any, any research going on in that subgroup of uh, patients? Thanks. That's a, that's a great question. So, um, the T414 translocation is one of these genetic abnormalities that we can find in myeloma cells. Uh, in this case, it's found in 10 or 15% of myeloma patients. Mm -hmm. And this is not an inherited abnormality, uh, but rather it's something that is acquired as the cancer develops. So it's not something that indicates a familial risk of myeloma. It's not something you're gonna pass on through the family, but it's just part of the cancer. And many years ago, you know, probably 20 years ago now, we, we learned that those myelomas that have this translocation in them uh, tend to behave more aggressively and outcomes aren't as good. 
as for most myeloma patients. And so we've been trying to figure out how to deal with that. Uh, there is, uh, you know, over the years, people have tried to, to figure out what it is about this translocation that drives the myeloma and how to target that. This translocation leads to the overexpression of a tyrosine kinase protein called FGFR3, and people have developed drugs to target FGFR3. We haven't yet found one that uh, has proven to be a good myeloma treatment, but people continue to work on that, especially now that we know that there are certain further mutations in that FGFR3 gene that, that are important. Um, but just knowing that this confers a higher risk, uh, people have asked, well, should we be treating these patients differently? And I guess the, the long and short of it is we haven't really found a really strong way to improve the outcome of T414 myeloma yet uh, by changing the treatment or doing something different. Some people would argue that, that this is a group of patients that falls in the category of high-risk myeloma and that maybe someone who's had a transplant or maybe someone who hasn't, that you should really make sure you use a proteasome inhibitor uh, more consistently as part of the initial therapy. And so that's sometimes done. Um, although, uh, you know, really the evidence supporting that is a bit limited, but, but it's a commonly held idea that, that is often done. Um, there was an idea on the flip side that maybe we should forget about doing an autologous transplant for these patients because we looked at this some years ago in Canada, uh, led by Donna Reese and the Toronto group, and they were just finding that autologous transplant wasn't improving the outcomes all that much for this group of patients. But, um, you know, it, it, most of us still consider it reasonable as an option to incorporate it for these patients. So transplant will still at least be discussed with T414 myeloma patients. Uh, so, you know, I guess the short answer is we're still working on that one. Cool, thank you. Thanks for that, that explanation. Um, the next question, uh, you mentioned um, a, a few times in the presentation, or maybe once, uh, I can't recall exactly, but um, mineral uh, MRD, minimal residual disease. Um, so mineral residual disease, um, you know, is, is that something that's that's being used in, in, in Canadian practice uh, routinely? Uh, do you think it will be used if it's not? Uh, uh, you know, it, is, would it be a welcome, useful tool in Canadian practice, basically? Right. So as I mentioned earlier, minimal residual disease assessment involves using more sensitive techniques to try and detect uh, residual myeloma cells that persist after treatment that maybe aren't picked up with the tools we use commonly, like serum protein electrophoresis or, or any kind of scans. Um, and um, so I mentioned that sometimes we collect a sample of bone marrow to look for minimal residual disease, and sometimes we use genetic sequencing to do that. We can also use another technique called flow cytometry to do that with the bone marrow. There is uh, a newer technique that's more sensitive at detecting myeloma protein in the blood uh, using a technology called mass spectrometry uh, that is also quite promising. And uh, we can also look for tumor DNA that has been shed into the blood with next generation sequencing. So these are ways to look in the blood with more sensitive techniques for residual myeloma. We're also looking at, you know, can we use PET scans to complement what we get with blood and bone marrow examinations to look for residual myeloma. So these are all some of the technologies that are out there to, to look for small amounts of myeloma. We can detect as few as one myeloma cells in a million bone marrow cells with some of these techniques. Uh, they aren't widely available uh, as a matter of routine in Canada. They may become more widely available soon. The flow cytometry method that I mentioned of looking at bone marrow may, may become more widely available as hospital laboratories buy new flow cytometry machines that have the capability of doing this. Then it might not be such a big deal. And it only costs a few hundred bucks to, to do a minimal residual disease assay by flow cytometry um, as compared to sequencing, which currently costs a couple thousand dollars or more. Um, so the cost will come down and, and that may make it more accessible to do the sequencing approach. And these blood techniques as they develop may, may prove their value and become more widely available. Um, but what we're missing is also is just um, an understanding of how we can use that information to improve the treatment. And so there's a whole group of clinical trials being done right now that ask the question, well, if there's no detectable minimal residual disease, 
do we have to keep treating a patient indefinitely like we do now? Maybe we could stop or maybe we could cut back on the treatment and do just as well in the long run. So there are studies looking at that. And there are studies looking at the opposite question. If, if there's still minimal residual disease present, should we escalate the treatment and, and try and get a better outcome that way? So we don't have the answers to those questions yet, but um, certainly minimal residual disease assessment can give us a bit more information about how the disease is behaving and how well it's responded to treatment and how things are likely to go in the future. And even just for that reason, I think it would be a useful tool to have more widely available. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I guess if I if, if I can uh, read a little bit between the lines, uh, MRD is probably the, the the closest thing to coming to, to to practice, but there's other options using peripheral blood that that could also come in. So uh, that might be better than MRD or uh, or we don't well, know. It'd be you know nice not to have to have a bone marrow biopsy. Yeah, your uh, residual disease in this way. So, so those tools uh, are being being developed, and, and we're doing some of that work in Canada. Some some of the folks listening may be participating in that work. Awesome, thank you. Um, we have a question here. Uh, it's a sim simple question. Can you have a second transplant after relapsing? I know in the first study you you did discuss that. Uh, uh, so if you could just maybe just elaborate a little bit on ha uh, second transplants after relapse and uh, who who are eligible for, the, for for that and who wouldn't be eligible for that. Right. So uh, having another round of high-dose chemotherapy and another infusion of stem cells and another autologous transplant is certainly an option for some patients. So um, it's hard to collect enough stem cells to do a transplant after a patient has had a lot of treatment. So what we do is we try and collect enough stem cells first time round that we could do more than one transplant. And then we just save some of them, keep them in the freezer, and only use some of what we've collected to do the first transplant. And so not everyone should have another transplant, but, but um, I mean, there have been studies done that would suggest that you should do two transplants in a row. The evidence on that is somewhat conflicting, and it's certainly hard to do two in a row. And, so in Canada, we've taken the approach of saying, well, let's do one and then save the option of doing another one for the future. If a patient doesn't have a real good response to the first transplant, maybe we'll do two in a row just to see if we can get a deeper remission. Um, so that's sometimes done for a really fit patient who did really well with the first transplant and has recovered quickly. Uh, but I would say most patients aren't doing that. But, but a lot of patients will then, when they relapse after their first transplant, we'll ask ourselves, should they have a second transplant at that point? And, you know, it really depends on how well things went with the first one and how things are going now. You know, the longer your remission was with the first transplant, the more likely it is it's going to be worthwhile to go through the, the rigor of having a second transplant. It's not the easiest thing to do, especially the second time around. It's a little mm -hmm. riskier, I think, um, and certainly a little harder, a lot, maybe a longer recovery time. And you can expect the second one to work no better than the first one. It may not work as well as the first one. Typically, it's going to work less well. So, as a rule of thumb in Canada, we sort of say, well, as long as people had at least a couple of years of remission, uh, you know, with the first transplant, and they're looking and feeling like they could go through a second one and did reasonably well getting through the first one, we could consider a second one. But if you know someone is now 80 years old and it's been 10 years since they had their first transplant, um, and maybe now they're more frail, maybe have other health issues that might make it hard to get through a second transplant. Maybe that patient shouldn't have a second one. Maybe a patient who had a transplant and then only a year later their disease has relapsed. Maybe they're not going to get much out of a second transplant. So those are the kinds of things we have to think about when considering that. But it is, it is certainly an option to consider, especially if we've collected enough stem cells ahead of time to do more than one transplant. So it's, it's case by case like everything else. Um, so I have two questions left. We, uh, we're, we're, about, we're at two o'clock. Do you have an extra five minutes or uh, do you have a hard stop? Uh, oh, I, I have some time. If people want to hang around, I realize everybody else may have to go, but I can stick around for a while. Awesome. And, and, and the, the webinar is recorded. So if anybody does have to leave, you can always go and access the recording to, 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 to get the answers to the last few questions. Uh, so, so, so thank you for that, Dr. Ryman. Uh, the, the next question, uh, I, I I'm not sure it's a complete question. I think we might be missing some information. I'll ask it to you anyways, uh, so maybe you can uh, let me know. But um, the, the, this person, uh, uh, I mean, I mean can, can dexamethasone cause neuropathy? Okay, so questions is about neuropathy. So maybe I'll start by answering the question you've asked. Uh, 
Um, we don't really think that dexamethasone causes uh, neuropathy. So it's more typically one of the other drugs. The ones, the ones that most commonly cause it are well, bortezomib is a big one. Um, thalidomide, for those who may have had thalidomide at some point, used, used to cause a lot of neuropathy. Uh, years ago, we used to use older chemotherapy drugs like vincristine, and you know, these days people still occasionally get older chemotherapy drugs like cisplatin that can cause neuropathy. Um, but you know, um, the other proteasome inhibitors like carfilzomib and exazomib, they're they're much less apt to cause neuropathy. The newer imids like lenalidomide and pomalidomide much less apt to cause neuropathy. Although I personally, I think in some patients you still see a bit of neuropathy from those drugs. And it's sort of a cumulative thing. The more neurotoxic drugs you've had, the more neuropathy you can get. Um, and sometimes it's a bit of a delayed reaction too. Like sometimes you don't notice the neuropathy until you've been on treatment for a while, or maybe even after you stop the treatment. So um, 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 those are some of the issues with with neuropathy. Yeah, I, I, I've heard kind of the analogy of of, of uh, you know like when 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 there's a lot of noise in the room, you you might not notice something, but then as things quiet down, you know you start to kind of feel it. So maybe I think that's that's kind of uh, uh, I think that was applied to neuropathy when I heard that explanation. But but anyways, I I, I digress. might just explain what it is while we're at it for those listening who don't know what the term means. But mm -hmm. neuropathy refers to damage to nerves. And typically referring to smaller nerve endings like in the hands and feet as opposed to say the brain or the spinal, spinal cord or things like that and so some of the drugs we use can damage nerves and and typically people notice it in the tips of their fingers the tips of their toes and as the problem progresses the, the symptoms can progress from the tips of the, the hands or feet further on up the arm or leg and and, and what it is is you get a numbness a tingling, pins and needles kind of feeling like the, the hand or foot is asleep where you can get a burning discomfort um, and uh, you can get some loss of sensation. It's usually more of a sensation as opposed to, you know, your nerves won't tell your muscles to work. So you can still usually move your arm or your leg or your hand or your foot, but it's this feeling that you get. And it can be bothersome and it can be downright uncomfortable and painful. And uh, so that that's what we're talking about. And, um, uh you know, for someone who is experiencing neuropathy, um, what kind of strategies uh, are there to try to reduce that? Is it, is it you know, dose reduction? Is it change of drug? Uh, um, or is it pretty much, you know, uh, take some uh, nerve uh, nerve blockers? Or what, how, uh, what's the kind of, someone who it's really a big issue and how do you, how do you deal with it? Well, first off, you have to ask patients about it frequently when they're on treatments that can cause neuropathy and, uh, you know, hear from them what symptoms they're getting of neuropathy. You can examine people and see, you know, how badly their sensation has been affected by neuropathy and uh, try and use this information to intervene as early as you can under the circumstances. I mean, it's a challenge because on the one hand, we only have so many effective myeloma treatments. We want to get the most out of each one that we can. We don't want to have to cut back or stop an effective treatment because of neuropathy, but sometimes that's what we have to do. Um, and uh, you know, sometimes we have to manage the symptoms with medication, painkillers, uh, certain other types of drugs that have been found to dampen the, the painful symptoms of neuropathy. And you know, with time, sometimes neuropathy can improve as the body heals itself but you need a fair bit of time off these neurotoxic drugs to see that happen it can take a couple of years or more to see improvement and um, so a classic example someone who's had bortezomib as part of their initial treatment and get a lot of neuropathy well maybe if they are able to avoid bortezomib and don't receive any other sort of severely neurotoxic drugs for several years after that their, their neuropathy symptoms can improve with time Great, thank you. Uh, while we were talking, we got a, another question with regards to side effects. I've, I've, I've personally never heard of this side effect with, uh, you know, with this drug, but uh, I'm, you know, I, I haven't heard everything, obviously. So uh, someone's asking about um, severe shortness of breath uh, with uh, lenalidomide. Is, is that a, is that a common issue? Is, is there any concern uh, with, with that side effect? Well, um, shortness of breath is a common problem in cancer patients generally, myeloma patients, no exception. And there can be many different causes of shortness of breath. 
it isn't usually simply a side effect of one of our drug treatments. Like usually if there's shortness of breath that's related to one of our treatments, it's because the treatment has caused some other problem that's creating shortness of breath. And so um, it can be anything from, you know, infection in the lungs to, uh, you know, low red blood cell levels, you know, because those red blood cell levels carry oxygen to our tissues. And if we have a low red blood cell level or an anemia, as it's called, we can feel short of breath. Um, occasionally people can develop blood clots that can, can uh, affect the lungs and that can cause shortness of breath. Um, you know, it's rare for people to have any kind of lung damage from myeloma drugs, but once in a great while that can happen, but that's less common. So, you know, there's this list of things and there's a longer list. I mean, the myeloma itself can cause shortness of breath in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so I guess the long and short of it is it's good to just say, if you're feeling short of breath, make sure you, you tell your doctor, especially make sure your myeloma specialist hears about it. If you're a myeloma patient uh, on one of these treatments and, uh, you know, get the problem evaluated because you don't want to just pass it off as a, an effect of the treatment that doesn't need to be uh, concerned with. Especially if the treatment test, you know, is ongoing, then, you know, that could worsen things, right? So uh, it's also also great to discuss with your with your healthcare team. Okay. Um, so the last the last question I'm going to ask, I guess it's kind of two questions in one. It's a it's a two two prong question. Um, you know, a lot of the the, ther the newer therapies that we talked about a little bit later in the presentation, uh, the CAR T's and the bispecifics um, and, and and a few other molecules, um, you know, they, they had some pretty pretty uh, great uh, response uh, percentages that that you showed on, on on the screen there. So so basically that they're active in myeloma and that and, and that they're they're doing, uh, you know, they're they're treating the myeloma. Now. To, to me, that's that's a good thing, obviously, because you know it, it shows a lot of uh, the, the the thing that I have in mind when I when I think about the uh, about those response rates is that you're you know th those trials you're getting those response rates and it's one drug it's not a combination of drugs um, th that are being used in those trials and so um, <laughs> and I and I know you probably get this question uh, you know taking that into consideration and 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 uh, taking uh, you know as part of you know taking that into consideration and taking uh, consideration that patients you know they want improved quality of life and they want uh, a cure for myeloma so how you know how by combine you know eventually by combining all of these new treatments and and, and looking at, at different ways to treat them how, how close are we to, to a cure for myeloma or you know are we uh, 30 years away are we closer than that uh, you know, can you maybe just comment a little bit on 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 how promising all of these therapies are, and 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 if their combinations could potentially lead to a cure down the line. Well, it's a great question. I mean, as I say, some of these immunotherapies seem to be curing or helping to cure other types of uh, blood cancers, particularly leukemias and lymphomas. Um, and uh, you know, so could this happen with myeloma? I think maybe it could. I mean, one of the questions we could turn that on its head and say, well, why, why if it's curing those other diseases have we so far not been able to cure myeloma? Mm -hmm. And uh, we don't know all the reasons for that, but we think that some of it has to do with the fact that in myeloma patients, the immune system is often, you know, damaged by the disease or intrinsically, you know, abnormal. You know, after all, myeloma in a way is a cancer of the immune system. And so, you know, there's, there's problems with the immune system in patients with myeloma and the treatments we use often aggravate that problem and uh, so the immune system is in in good shape to to fight the cancer even if we give some kind of immune based treatment that might help um, so you know we have to overcome that challenge uh, but you know we have so many different immune therapies for myeloma that seem to work now and we have now two or three different myeloma targets we got BCMA we got these two new ones I mentioned FCRH5 and TPCRH5 and uh, um, so maybe maybe combining these things will be effective. And so, you know, one of the companies, you know, that, that makes one of these drugs, uh, you know, against uh, GPCR5 uh, also has one against BCMA. And so, you know, they're, they're going to try and combine those. And eventually you'll see more combinations and you'll see some of these immune therapies combined with conventional therapies like the Bellamaf-POMDEX trial that Dr. Trudell presented. 
and uh, you know these treatments will be brought earlier into the course of myeloma treatment. You know, new things first get tried for people who tried all the available stuff mm -hmm. that we know has some benefit. And so, first of all, to see a drug work in that setting is remarkable. And secondly, to see them work even as well as they are is, is remarkable. I mean, daratumumab had a 30% response rate in its initial trials as a single agent for heavily treated myeloma. Now we're seeing much higher response rates to these therapies. So, so that's certainly promising. How close are we to a cure? Is it going to be two years, 10, 30? <laughs> I don't know. Can't say. <laughs> that's a crystal ball good, question. Good answer. But I think we're making <laughs> progress, you know. And I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility. I think we're going to keep trying. Yeah, you know, uh, um, you know, with, with that plus with uh, as we mentioned earlier in the question period with the uh, MRD techniques or techniques to detect, you know, how how much myeloma is left, I think might uh, might help uh, guide those uh, guide those treatments as well. Um, lastly, just on on your last point, uh, um, what do you think about about combining something like CAR T with transplant, for example, do you think that's a viable, uh, you know, uh, something that could be tried? Yeah, I mean, people are thinking that way. People have already tried it a little bit. Uh, there's the idea that maybe after a course of high-dose chemotherapy is a good time to give these cell therapies where you've uh, maybe got an immune system that's starting to reconstitute itself after some effective myeloma therapy has been done to clear the myeloma out of there and make some room, elbow room for the immune system to get in and, and do more work. And maybe that low level of disease that you have after high dose chemotherapy, you know, maybe, maybe if you can beat the disease down to a certain level with high dose chemotherapy, maybe, maybe some type of immunotherapy could get rid of what's left if it's at a low level, you know? So, mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You know, all sorts of combinations of these available types of therapy are going to be combined. And there's lots of rationale for doing that. I mean, these immunomodulatory drugs like Brevlimid and Homilis, you know, have immunomodulatory properties that may turn out to be helpful, you know, if you combine them with newer immunotherapies. We, we don't really know, but the Bellamaf POMDEX trials is kind of an example of that. And so, so we'll see. Um, you know, we always take all the effective treatments we have and try every possible way to sort of combine or sequence them to get the best and most out of the treatments we've got. Uh, and then, you know, something new comes along and we get to figure out how to incorporate that. And it's a constantly uh, changing approach. Awesome. Um, we got just one last question that came in as you are answering that one. And I, I, I think you could answer this one pretty quickly since uh, you probably get this one often. Um, Someone just wondering about the benefit of uh, of maintenance therapy uh, with uh, with lenalidomide. lenalidomide. So, uh, you know, has it shown to have an overall survival benefit? Uh, you could just comment on that quickly before we uh, we go. Yeah, I mean that's the main reason that we prescribe lenalidomide maintenance therapy in Canada is that the weight of the evidence is that there is a survival benefit, an overall survival benefit to maintenance lenalidomide. Um, you know, if you look at individual trials, um, you'll see that uh, some of the trials, particularly one of the larger ones done in, the, in North America, showed an overall survival benefit. And if you look at a meta-analysis combining different trials of lenalidomide maintenance together, you know, it suggests there's a survival benefit. And, uh, you know, it is, it is a big commitment to go on long-term maintenance therapy, sometimes for years and years. And I think it's still fair to ask, well, do people need to go on maintenance therapy indefinitely? And some of the ongoing trials are looking at that question a little bit, especially in patients who achieve an MRD negative result. So there's a trial in North America ongoing that hopefully soon will be open in Canada where we look at patients who've had maintenance therapy and are MRD negative and ask whether they could stop their maintenance therapy. And uh, so, um, but right now it's, it's, it's the best proven standard maintenance therapy. And, uh, awesome. As a proof survival. Good. Thank you. Thanks so much for uh, for clarifying and for for uh, clarifying that clarifying that for us. And so with that, uh, we, I don't have any more questions. Uh, so I'd like to uh, thank you again and uh, wish you uh, a great rest of your uh, of your day. Thanks. It's been my honor to speak with you and to all of our uh, patients and caregivers and those uh, in attendance. And I hope uh, you found it helpful. It's a lot of information and. Uh, 
we'll have to try and cover in a short time, but hopefully you get a flavor of some of the progress that's been made in the last year and uh, maybe where we're heading in the next few years. It's a great presentation. Thanks, thanks a lot and uh, have a good one. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thank you.